I'm going to discuss the Contaplex C catheter over needle system. Uh, I'm William Ermey. Uh, I'm from the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. This is where I practice. We do, I do about 99% regional anesthesia in my practice. Uh, continuous peripheral nerve blocks are really defined as the percutaneous insertion of a flexible catheter to targeted nerve or nerves, usually a plexus of nerves. And there are advantages to doing these continuous peripheral nerve blocks. And that includes targeted controllable analgesia, minimal side effects, you have unlimited block duration, you can make it last for days. And the important thing in terms of complications, you're at a distance from the neuraxis so that you limit any of the central complications that are seen with spinal or epidurals. There are some disadvantages to conventional peripheral nerve blocks, uh, uh, continuous ones. And that includes limited control of the catheter tip. Typically, it, it's been done with a larger blunt traumatic needle. There's increased technical difficulty. And then there's secondary block failure. That is, the original block works immediately, uh, but then later you have dislodgement, migration, or just the block is in the wrong area of the plexus, or the catheter is in the wrong area of the plexus. And then there's frequent failure to achieve the complete analgesia that's desired because of the position of the catheter tip is not controllable. Uh, many people have shown, and many uh, recent studies have shown, that the catheters that we place for continuous nerve blocks aren't precisely where we want them to be. This one by Ganapathy in 1999 found that only 62 continuous, uh, on six, 62 continuous fascial iliaca blocks only 40% of the catheters were positioned appropriately. Captavilla also found with 100 continuous femoral 3-in-1 blocks that the course of the catheter was completely unpredictable. There are many publications that show that continuous peripheral nerve blocks can work, but what we're missing, the problem is that there aren't many prospective randomized controlled trials comparing uh, continuous peripheral nerve blocks to other analgesic modalities. The typical uh, continu continuous peripheral nerve block study conclusion, and this is from Grant, and it's a direct quote, is that continuous peripheral nerve block using a TUI catheter system offered acceptable analgesia and prolonged pain relief after surgery. In a recent meta-analysis, uh, Richmond et al. Uh, found that uh, he, they looked at does continuous peripheral nerve block provide superior pain control to opioids, and this was a meta-analysis done in 2006. Uh, they found that perineural uh, catheters gave better analgesia than opioids, uh, and this was for all catheter locations and durations that were found in their, in their search, and there were lower rates of side effects. However, this really isn't good enough because, as we all know, opioid analgesia is very inferior and associated with a lot of problems. Uh, nausea and vomiting at our hospital is about 40% uh, in a one-year survey of patients on our acute pain service, pruritus about 28%, and then you have urinary retention and dizziness, uh, all opiate side effects, all that we want to eliminate. The single shot nerve block, when we do those, there are two strategies. The first is a single injection with a higher volume to spread around the nerve or throughout the plexus. The second, which is more popular now with ultrasonographic guidance, is usually multiple targeted injections using multiple aliquots of lower volume of local anesthetic. And this way you can spread the drug throughout the area and make sure that the entire area is covered. But how does this apply to continuous peripheral nerve block? How successful can we be with that? Well, it depends upon the regional anatomy. Uh, for example, continuous brachial plexus block I'll talk about first. And the anatomy is different above the clavicle versus below the clavicle. And there are a number of studies uh, over the last decade showing that continuous interscaling block can be very successful with a close to 100% success rate. Continuous interscaling block for shoulder surgery has been shown to have better analgesia versus just about everything, including IBPCA, subacromial infusion, intraarticular analgesia, and suprascapular block. Uh, Ilfeld looked at continuous interscaling brachial plexus block for post-operative pain control at home even, sending patients with catheters home in a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled study. 
they found that interscalene block by continuous catheter decreased pain, decreased opiate use, decreased side effects, and decreased sleep disturbances so that patients were more satisfied. If you look at, this is from Alan Winnie's textbook, the one who originally described, reported on interscalene block, this is an injection of radiographic contrast into the interscalene groove where the marker is. As you can see, the, in, the injection of local anesthetic fills the fascial confines of the brachial plexus, but it stays limited to above the clavicle in a sort of a triangular shape. And this, from uh, Danila Yankovic's textbook, is a fresh cadaver dissection showing that area where you see the nerve roots and trunks at the bottom. And you can see this is the area that's filled in that radiographic contrast depiction, and that's that triangular area. This is pretty much a flat, almost a potential anatomical space that's very limited compliance, so you can fill it very easily. And this is from a report I did years ago, and it shows the needle approach for a conventional interscalene block is right in that potential space along the nerve roots, usually at the upper part of it, and then we inject and it fills that area. Now, ultrasound-guided supraclavicular block is a similar situation. This study from uh, uh, McFarland and Brull uh, in Nysora in 2009, and you can see they're targeting the eight ball corner pocket to get that effect that you get it to spread throughout the area of the trunks at the, for uh, ultrasound guided supraclavicular block. Now the other problem with these catheters is that they're, it's a very short distance to the plexus above the clavicle. So they can easily dislodge if the patient moves during sleep or reaches up to you know, handle the catheter because it's uncomfortable. And I found in my practice that this can be easily solved with a soft cervical collar, and this prevents dislodgement. And in fact, I've never had a dislodgement from an interscalene catheter placed with the, uh, with the collar. It is soft, inexpensive, and prevents uh, movement of the head laterally so that the, the catheter tip stays pretty much constant in its uh, situation. What about continuous infraclavicular or axillary block? This has been a very different uh, experience for, for people placing these catheters. Axillary or infra, infraclavicular success rates for continuous blocks are only about 79 to 89% versus the 100% that we saw with blocks above the clavicle. Uh, Ilfeld, Robau, and Fusier in recent years have all shown this. And this is a, a cadaver dissection uh, showing the brachial plexus, and you can see up here above the clavicle, here's that triangular area with the nerve roots going to trunks. There are the vessels, and you can see it's pretty much a straight line, but as you get below the clavicle, which would be in this area, it branches out, you have fully differentiated terminal nerves that are widely separate in space. So if we do a block at this level, the coracoid or uh, infraclavicular block, or down here the axillary block, you get pretty much the same situation but you're not able to have a catheter that placed adequately can control this whole area because it's so broad and the volume compliance is so large. And this shows typical injection. Uh, again, this is from uh, Winnie's textbook showing radiographic contrast from an axillary block filling a smooth bordered plexus. This is a little extrav extravasation where the needle was actually placed and removed. This is almost the same filling pattern shown from a report that uh, Paolo Grossi did. We actually did this together in an earlier study, and you can see this is an infraclavicular coracoid block. The needle's in place there, and you can see it has that same spindle sausage shape that fills in a different pattern and stays, again, largely below or almost completely below the clavicle uh, by contrast to injections at the interscalene or supraclavicular level. And this is the fresh cadaver dissection correlates to that spread of local anesthetic, and this is what you see, that sausage spindle shape. And uh, stimulation of the posterior cord predicts successful infraclavicular block. This was published in 2006 by Lacombe-Wasson. Now, there are many studies showing this, that a radial or posterior cord placement of a stimulating needle actually results in better success than the other areas. So you can see here with a 40 milliliter single injection, the posterior cord only had about a 6% failure rate compared to almost 30% for the lateral cord or 15% for the medial cord 
in this study of infraclavicular block. Minville similarly showed in 2007 the optimal motor response for infraclavicular block with a radial response having a 96% success rate compared to much lower rates for median or ulnar uh, responses. Uh, Porter, McCartney, and Chan reported in 2005 that needle placement and injection posterior to the axillary artery, again where the posterior cord is, may predict successful infraclavicular brachial plexus uh, block in their report of three cases. And this is why it occurs. You can see there's the lateral, posterior, and medial cords, and you can see the posterior cord is neatly uh, very tight in its position with ultrasound uh, examination on many patients, it's almost always directly behind the artery and central to the brachial plexus, whereas the lateral cord and medial cord are much more unpredictable in their position and spread out, often not central, and that's why I think the larger failure rates occur. Uh, lower uh, local anesthetic volume by infusion using a catheter though, you can see why if you don't have it precisely placed and you don't have volume uh, helping you out by spreading it, the drug throughout the plexus that you can end up with a secondary block failure that's not always controllable. So the, the idea is to target the catheter tip to achieve optimal anesthesia and analgesia. And for example, continuous femoral nerve block, another one that's very, very successful and easy to perform. Many studies showing that, it's, that it is an adequate way and a very good way to treat postoperative uh, pain of the knee or lower extremity in the femoral distribution. There are multiple studies that show that there's better analgesia and less side effects compared to IVPCA or even uh, PCEA or patient-controlled epidural analgesia. The problem though with femoral uh, block is that there's a, an undesired motor block of the quadriceps and that prohibits the patients from ambulating postoperatively and from being able to, to fulfill their um, physical therapy uh, uh, milestones in an early fashion. And this is a study showing quadriceps motor power uh, on the non-operative side to the right versus the operative side. You can see it's much weaker on the operative side uh, as you look at the post-operative days, especially days one and two. And so this results in also a very serious, uh, uh, rare complication, but it's ha happened and been reported more frequently that, are, that is falls associated with lower extremity nerve blocks. This one was published in 2007 by Moraskin. And this is a video of Janet Cahill, one of our physical therapists with a patient, and they're uh, trying to ambulate with assistant immediately after uh, total knee replacement. They have a femoral block in. This is the second day. And you can see when they're going to, going to try, when the, this uh, patient is going to try to move forward, that her quadriceps is going to buckle and she's not going to be able to do the adequate therapy. And there's, there's an example of what often happens. And this is a patient who was in, in our unit years ago. There have been a, two of these ambulatory surgery patients had their knee arthroscopies uh, done under uh, using a femoral nerve block, single shot, and they were uh, ambulating too early, fell, and there's a fracture of the fibula resulting in this patient. This is a very serious complication that's easily preventable. So the new answer is, and this is what I've done pretty much now, instead of femoral nerve block, and, and, and it's especially good for continuous block, is the saphenous nerve or adductor canal block. And this is uh, a download from Mario Tedesco showing a typical saphenous block and the anatomy involved. And the saphenous nerve appears as a hyperechoic round structure near the femoral artery. And this is the femoral artery down to about the mid-thigh. And you can see here that you have the artery and the nerve. So it's easy to visualize, and this is the radio-opaque, or I'm sorry, ultrasound-opaque uh, nerve right above the artery. Okay, so this is a scanning technique uh, done for sonocyte, I believe by David Oyong, and you can see there's the needle trajectory, there's the nerve, and here's the artery. So the injection technique then, there's the shaft of the needle, and you'll see the injection now, 
and this is going to be in the adductor canal and you'll see radiograph um, you'll see ultrasonic spread of the local anesthetic injection and there it is so these blocks are easy to perform and they're ideal for continuous outpatient catheter techniques because they don't inhibit uh, function of the quadriceps muscle, which is the main muscle supporting uh, the patient's lower extremity when they're doing a physical therapy. What about continuous popliteal sciatic nerve block? Well, the conventional labat or infragluteal sciatic nerve block done up high has limited use for continuous peripheral nerve blocks because similar to blocking the quadriceps, it's blocking the powerful posterior uh, thigh muscles, which makes it difficult or impossible for the patient to ambulate or to do physical therapy after the surgery. But popliteal sciatic block, sciatic nerve block, is a different story. Here you can have excellent postoperative analgesia for knee, foot, or ankle pain, and there's an acceptable amount of motor blockade because it only blocks the muscles below the knee. It's great for outpatients. One of the problems is, though, that you have a foot drop. So if you're doing this for knee surgery where you're going to uh, have uh, where the, the surgeons are going to be nervous if there's a foot drop present, uh, you have to, uh, to exclude this uh, from your arsenal. But there's an answer to that now. There's an exciting new technique uh, recently described, and I've done a number of, and that is combined saphenous uh, tibial nerve block, isolated tibial nerve, just below the popliteal uh, uh, sciatic block position above the popliteal crease. And this provides analgesia for major knee surgery very effectively uh, after total knee or knee arthrotomy. Uh, Sinha reported on this in 2012. Femoral nerve block, in his case, combined with the tibial block, uh, gave effective analgesia for total knee replacement. And they found that there was no foot drop and that the patients were able to ambulate better. If you combine it with the saphenous block, you have absolute uh, uh, ability to ambulate afterwards. And here you can see this is where the tibial nerve splits from the common perineal nerve. The perineal nerve is what causes the foot drop and the tibial nerve you can inject very nicely and just have a tibial nerve effect from your uh, local anesthetic. What about stimulating catheters? Well, stimulating catheters, there are, are mixed results in the literature. There's many articles that are pro uh, uh, blocks using uh, stimulating catheters as, as uh, articles saying con that they don't work well, they're harder to achieve the desired response and they take longer. And here is from our teaching website at uh, Special Surgery. So these are experts doing this and you can see some of the problems that are involved with this. This is using ultrasound over here to the left, nerve stimulation up here, and someone who has, at, has a, a lot of experience with doing these techniques. And you can see this is just finding the original uh, plexus using a stimulating catheter. Then they cut because it takes a lot of time. And now they're going reaching for the, uh, for the catheter itself. They have a, a motor response, but that's with the needle. So now they're going to take out the stylet, and then they have to place the, the large stimulating catheter, which is cumbersome in my opinion, and that's why we don't use these very often at all on a, on a daily basis. Now you have to situate the catheter into the lumen of the stimulating needle, and you have to get a second stimulation to make sure that the catheter tip is where you'd like it to be. As you can see, this takes a lot of time. Uh, there's another cut because of the time requirements in the video. And so you can see this is not completely acceptable, uh, in my opinion, for daily use. What about ultrasonography in catheters? Well, this is from Gray. To have your uh, visibility, especially for an in-plane technique, you have to have the whole uh, needle or catheter linear and, in the, and parallel to the probe uh, when you're doing these techniques. Usually we do it in, in an in-plane technique with a short axis view. And this is from something I published uh, years ago 
with regard to putting a catheter through a TUI needle, which is the way this has been done, and it deviates, it moves out of that linear plane, and that's why it's very difficult to visualize uh, these. Swenson, in fact, a few years ago, talked about a novel approach for assessing catheter position uh, with ultrasound-guided placement of interscalene block. And even at the interscalene level, which is very superficial, he found, quote, the ability to visualize peripheral nerve catheters using ultrasound is limited. So I was at the 2005 Italian ESRA, European Society of Regional Anesthesia meeting, or Congresso, in Italy. And I was sitting in the front row and I was thinking, so what we have to do is to improve catheter techniques because there are so many problems associated with them. I would like to make it so we can make, you know, why not make every block continuous? Well, there are a number of reasons. There are a number of potential problems with continuous blocks the way they're done conventionally. The first, there's poor control of the catheter tip position. Uh, Francois Singelin uh, and, uh, looked for epidural anesthesia or, or reported epidural anesthesia complicating what was supposed to be a continuous three-in-one lumbar plexus block because the catheter tip wasn't where the desire, it was desired to be. Usually catheter placement is blind and it's too far, farther than desired. And this shows, again, if you're using a TUI needle, that the catheter will come out and deviate from wherever you want the catheter to be. But what if we could, could precisely control the catheter's tip? That would be a different story, and that would be different than what's been conventionally done. The second thing is that typically these require large traumatic needles. So there's an inertial aspect, and a lot of people are hesitant to use these because especially with superficial blocks, the needle carries forward because it's large and it's blunt. And this shows a large blunt uh, catheter system where first they're putting in a larger catheter. And you can see, look at the give here as it goes through that. And that give you'll have through every fascial or major tissue plane. So you're not controlling the trajectory as precisely as you'd like to. But what if we can make the needle catheter more like a single shot, more where, like where we can completely control and precisely control the tip? Another third thing is that they're technically more difficult. As you saw with the, with the uh, catheter system using a stimulating catheter, it's a very technically difficult and challenging thing to do and to do well. Well, what if we were to make this less te technically difficult, that is, fewer steps involved, so you didn't have to do all these different things in order to place a catheter. And finally, catheter migration. What if we could limit catheter migration by controlling where the catheter is and rescanning the catheter because it's linear? Uh, there are a number of, of problems with catheter migration. These are a few. Unintentional arterial catheter, catheterization and bupivacaine toxicity, which is serious, from continuous interscalene block. And here you can see the catheter migrated into a vessel, an artery, in fact. Unsuspected e epidural or extradural catheterization in an interscalene block. And here again, the catheter migrated because it was threaded too far because we didn't know where the tip was. What if the catheter had a straight direction and could be revisualized by ultrasound very easily? And also, what about the fact that these catheters may not achieve the adequate distribution of analgesia because we can't control where the tip is within the plexus or adjacent to the nerve that we, the targeted nerve where we'd really like it to be? Uh, Captabilla reported on continuous psoas compartment block, uh, new landmarks, technical guidelines, and cl clinical evidence, and found that in 74% of the uh, patients, catheters weren't located where he wanted to be. They were within the psoas major muscle. And in 22%, they were located under the fascia iliaca in the area between the psoas and quadratus lumborum muscles. One was in the abdominal cavity, even. So you can see that's just not acceptable. And this shows one of the catheters located within the psoas major muscle in this radiograph. And here's another one located under the fascia iliaca. So what if we could determine local anesthetic spread under direct ultrasonographic vision? And finally, most importantly, I think what we want to do is to find a way that anybody can do a successful and reliable continuous 
peripheral nerve block. So I was thinking, how could we make a better catheter system that works with electrical nerve stimulation, or ENS, and ultrasonographic guidance that is US? And I was thinking, how could we make a catheter over needle system? That might be one way that we could do that. But the hard part is, how can you stabilize a uh, flexible catheter, small catheter, desirable catheter, over a needle so that you can place these? And then I was thinking, the way to do this is to to limit the number of degrees of freedom of motion along the longitudinal axis so that it stays straight while we're placing it. And this was a device, a stimuplex guide that I developed uh, with B. Braun uh, years ago. And this had a screw clamp mechanism. And I thought, wait a minute, this was meant to guide a stimulating needle and has really been eclipsed, the use of it, by ultrasonographic technology. But I thought we could actually use that this technology to stabilize a catheter. And at the same meeting, there was a spina cath, which is not legal in the United States, prohibited by our FDA, but they're used in Europe with frequency for microspinal anesthesia. So I found this and used this as a prototype. This was a small gauge, 24 needle, through about a 20-gauge uh, catheter, and I was able to use that in conjunction with the Stimuplex guide to make a prototype. And I went back to the hotel where they had a bowl of fruit, and I placed this successfully in a banana and an apple. And then I flew home to New York where I was able to place it in a chicken and in a, a steak, and with ultrasonographic guidance or dissection, it maintained a straight linear trajectory and was visible easily by ultrasound. We reported on this in patients subsequently in 2007. Paolo Grossi and I looked at the stabilization of a flexible 22 gauge catheter using multiple external compression units uh, for continuous peripheral nerve block and we reported on our initial experience. All the blocks were, were clinically successful there was one that dislodged, but we didn't have the soft cervical collar in that institution that prevents that. No leakage was noted at the insertion site. All the blocks were graded as easy or stable, and the feel of placing these blocks was similar to doing a single shot 22 gauge needle. If you closed your eyes, you wouldn't know the difference. The mean times for insertion were very short, mean of 91 seconds, injection, took a little while, 121 seconds, but the catheter placement was only 30 seconds because the catheter's already there. You just had to remove the needle and then hook up the connector to the lure lock system. Uh, we found that the external compression units effectively stabilized the flexible catheter over needle. That continuous peripheral nerve block was technically similar to a single shot and the precise catheter tip placement was doable with either peripheral nerve stimulation or ultrasonographic guidance or both. And this is what it's become. This is courtesy of B. Braun showing the needle. This is a stimulating needle that's coated so that it, it uh, has uh, stimulation only at the tip and then the catheter is over this needle. And this is a 19 gauge very flexible catheter the contaplex C catheter. There's a needle within the lumen of the catheter and this is a single hand adjustable clamp which acts to stabilize the structure. And if you move this down and this is within one or two centimeters of the tip it feels and acts as though you're using a 19 gauge uh, needle. It's a very easy to place. And, to, and has the feel of a single shot. So this is now used to access the plexus and you can make your single injection uh, through the needle or you can make multiple injections through the needle. You can move the needle catheter system around once it's in there to target the different areas and you can leave the catheter wherever you'd like in its precise position in the local anesthetic deposition zone that occurs when we inject around the nerve or nerves. And there's the injection, then the clamp, the needle removes, 
when the clamp slides off the catheter, and then the catheter is similar to what we would have for any of our catheters placed that are through a needle. Here's a uh, typical placement of the contaplex C catheter over needle for a femoral nerve block. Here you can see the ultrasonographic visibility is excellent. And if you were to pull the needle out, you can, as you'll see in some of the videos I'll show, you can see the, the lumen of the catheter even when this is placed. There's stimulation for the femoral block. So you can use this. It's really a stimulating catheter, but it's, it acts as though you're using a stimulating needle. So it's much, sim much uh, uh, similar in effect, but much easier to perform than the conventional stimulating catheters. Here it is being used for a posterior uh, approach, or I'm sorry, a, this is an out-of-plane approach for interscalene continuous block. So here's the patient's nose would be up here, the neck, and here's the clavicle, and you can see you're able to, to place it right into the plexus. There it is popping into the uh, plexus fascia, again emphasizing that you have to use the clamp a short distance. We suggest a maximum of two centimeters from where it is in the skin, and this is done in small increments, but it's very easily controllable. And this is a catheter that I placed uh, for, a, for a saphenous block. And you can see the lumen of the catheter. This was done in February. And I just took a picture using the uh, ultrasound uh, printer. And here's the nerve. And there's the tip of the catheter and the lumen. And you can see that you can, you can place it here or you could place it over here in the local anesthetic deposition zone, wherever you'd like. And the next video is of a, an axillary block that we performed just a week ago. Dr. Stanton at our institution, one of our fellows, and it was the first time he used the contaplex C system. And you can see we have the color Doppler on. In comes the needle catheter system. You can see the shaft here right adjacent to the artery. And now the, the needle injection causes a local anesthetic deposition zone there. We end up removing the needle, and you're going to see the catheter. Right there is the catheter lumen. And then injection done, there's the lumen. And now you're going to see an injection done through that lumen that causes a broader local anesthetic deposition zone that will be dark in this area. There's the lumen of the catheter and the tip. So we were hooking it up now, and then you'll see an injection shortly. There it is. We're going to turn the color Doppler off, I believe, and you'll see dark. And there's the local anesthetic deposition, and the catheter moves in and out of the field as you inject, but you can easily revisualize. So here is the saphenous block, the needle catheter system coming in just above the artery, right adjacent to the nerve. And now the injection is going to be made through the needle, which compresses the artery, something I look for. And now the area expands. The needle is removed, and the catheter is in place. Now the injection is made through the catheter, and you can see the tip of the catheter is here, the lumen is here, the nerve becomes completely surrounded, and the artery is down here being compressed. And we can leave that catheter here and rescan it easily. 
and I'm going to show you that the catheter is now stable right next to the nerve by moving the catheter. And there you can see we're moving the catheter under ultrasonographic guidance. So what happens when we inject through the needle catheter system is that a local anesthetic deposition zone is defined in real time. And here is a, an example from that picture I showed you before for the tibial nerve. And here you could take the uh, contaplex C needle catheter system and place it here, or you could even go under the nerve here, or you could in inject more, make the local anesthetic zone bigger, and place it above the nerve. So you have complete control of where you want the final catheter to be, and you can make it so that it's in a plexus or in the neurovascular or neural sheath as, as far as you'd like it to be, but it's controllable. That makes the possibility of dual catheters with Y connections so that we can now place more than one catheter within a plexus so we don't have that secondary failure rate that's due to inadequate spread of the local anesthetic because we're giving a small volume over time. And so for this axillary block shown here, here are muscular cutaneous nerve, median, ulnar, and radial. We want to get all of those so we could actually target one and then target another uh, catheter in between the nerves or adjacent to the nerve or even adjacent to the artery. So in conclusion, continuous peripheral nerve block offers major advantages for postoperative analgesia. You get controlled targeted analgesia, especially if you can control the catheter's tip. You can now use short-acting local anesthetics because if you have an excellent catheter system, you don't have to give an, an original long-acting block. So you can now use short-acting blocks that you can control by cutting back if there's too much motor block or too much sensory block, and you can change the solutions very easily uh, along the time course. You may change, start, or stop an infusion at any time to check for side effects or complications. And I think we are solving many of the problems associated with continuous peripheral nerve block with this catheter system because it offers so many advantages to the way we've done things in the past. Thank you very much.